Welcome back. Listen, I just want to say if you're an audio listener, you're missing out today. I never say that before, but like go check out the visuals at Miss Manga Butt on YouTube because I mean, I look fantastic. I look stellar. I have a sty in my eye. I have the <laughs> most ginormous sty in my eye that I have ever had. I think this is like three years worth of sty that has built up and it has officially erupted into my eyeballs. I went to the optometrist. That sounds fancy. I went to an eye doctor. They gave me antibiotics. I gotta be like this for a week. So just get ready with all these videos with me wearing sunglasses because I mean, can you imagine I do a video like this? Ah! <laughs> it's embarrassing. It looks like I got eyeshadow on. Today we're talking about the squid gang. Wait, gang? <laughs> it's a gang of squids. The squid game, otherwise known as Ojinga game, which honestly it sounds cooler in Korean. This is a Korean Netflix little like series, ep season one. It was the best shit ever. I don't know what else to say. I I really did not want to do another BAM on a series or a movie because I have been back to back disappointed recently and I just took a risk mainly because I wanted to watch it so badly. I was like, whatever, if it sucks, I just won't do a BAM on it, but it's so good. So today we're going to be talking about Squid Game and making ketchup. Okay, here's the thing. <laughs> this is completely useless. It's uh, it's ketchup inside of a French. Have you guys ever had the problem where you're eating French fries and you want to dip it in ketchup, but that seems like a peasant thing to do. That seems like a waste of your time, a waste of your muscle movement. Imagine now a French fry with ketchup inside. That's genius. This is obviously his idea. <laughs> he was like, we gotta make this. And I was I like, okay. I approve this message. <laughs> so I'm gonna start peeling these potatoes while I talk to you about Squid Game. This has been highly anticipated, even by my fiance who refused to watch it because he wanted to listen to me talk to you about it. And if you guys don't like gory stuff, just be warned. It's a pretty gory show. I'm not gonna show the goriness on here, so you're safe here. Now, the Squid Game, what is the premise of this? It all starts with the main character by the name of Ki Hoon. We're gonna call him Greg, though. <laughs> He's fucking Greg today. So, Greg, I mean, you get to see kind of bits and pieces of his life. He's living with his mom in a not so great place, and he's just got a personality on him. In the beginning, I was unsure if I was gonna like him because this is his personality, right? His mom is working at one of those night markets. And she's got a bad back. I mean, she's getting old. She's hustling. She's bringing all these heavy vegetables to sell at the night market for literally zero dollars. And he's sitting there in his little Adidas trainers. Tell him, ah, stop working. Stop working. You're too old to work. You're going to hurt yourself. And she's saying, well, who the fork's going to pay rent, huh? If I stop working, are you going to pay rent? And he's like, yeah, 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 I got my, I got my gig as a chauffeur. I'll, I'll pay the rent. I got you, mom. I'm the big man around here. And she's letting him know your chauffeuring job can't even pay the interest on the loans, on the debt that you have. So get your booty out of here. She's even the one that plops $10 onto the table and says, get your daughter something for her dinner. She likes fried chicken and he's upset. Because he's thinking, my 10-year-old daughter? You think I want to give her fried chicken for her birthday? Now nah, i got to get something extra special. And she's upset because she's like, we have no money, you crazy person. So as she leaves her work, he decides that he's going to go through his own mother's things, find her debit card, go to the bank, and withdraw money. Withdraw a bunch of cash from it. He withdraws the last remaining couple hundred dollars that she had, and he goes straight to the horse stalls. It's like this massive building where people start betting on these horse races. It's not even live. Like it's it's on a big screen. You go to the teller, you bet your money, and then you get money back. So he's watching it, he's getting stressed, and you can kind of already see how this guy's in debt. He's all about the horses. He ends up winning money today though. I was shook. You look like the Squirtle. I look like Squirtle. <laughs> I look like I would win Squid Game. Look at this. This is the face of someone who you don't even know what Squid Why Game is about. Why is it called Squid Game? Ojinga Game. Why? I'll tell you. Oh, well, you don't know until reason. the last episode. Ah. <laughs> it's a children's game called ah. Ojinga Game. Oh, there is a game. You know, I've never played it. I'm game. gonna be honest with you. It's a Korean game. I'm gonna be honest with you. I've never heard of it. Ah, okay. I should ask my mom. I should do market research. 
who the hell is playing Squid Game? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> These glasses, I swear, turned me into a different person. I'm sorry. <laughs> so he wins all this money and he's walking out of that horse riding, you know, building with his friend and he gets on the phone and he calls up his little daughter, 10 year old daughter, and he's like, listen, you make a list. You make a list of everything, every expensive item of food that you want to consume for your birthday dinner tonight because daddy got you. Don't even worry about the birthday present. I get you the best birthday present ever. And as he's flexing on his own kid, he sees a group of very dangerous looking guys slowly approaching him as if they're trying to trap him. And that's exactly what they're trying to do. So he runs back into the building and that's when in the lobby of this horse racing building, he slams into a woman who slashes the inner pocket of his suit and she is a master pickpocketer. She pickpockets the whole wad of cash that he had just won, every single dollar of it. So he doesn't even notice, that's how good she is. And he starts running into the bathroom and he gets slammed into a stall. Those dudes are his loan sharks. And they start getting aggressive with him. They start beating him up. His nose is bleeding. They try to stick a screwdriver up his nose. Yeah, just lobotomize the guy in broad daylight. Why don't you? So they're like, listen, you need, we need the money. He's like, I got it. I got some money, right? I was saving it up because I wanted to give it to you all at once. And he reaches into his inner suit pocket and it's slashed with a knife. So like, you know, he got pickpocket. He's like, I promise next month you're going to get the money. Like, seriously, just trust me. And they tell him, Okay, then sign this document. That means if you don't give the money to us in the next month, we're gonna take your livers, we're gonna take your kidneys, and we're gonna take your eyeballs. There's only one liver, sorry, sorry for the plural. We're gonna take it all. So sign this document, he signs his name, and they said, fingerprint it, like a little notary. I, I don't have any ink. They punch him in the nose, they get his thumb, swipe it on the nosebleed, and slam it onto the piece of paper, and they leave the bathroom. Now, I don't even think this guy read it, okay? It's like when we don't read the terms and conditions. So he did not read this document that his bloody fingerprint is now on, but Honestly, they end up leaving. Like, how legitimate is that nosebleed fingerprint? See, that's what I was wondering too, when people make you sign these crazy contracts, like when cults make you sign contracts to give up like 9,999 yeah. years into literally just unpaid exactly. work. Who's enforcing this? Like, does it hold up in court? Yeah. Cause I can make you send one right now. <laughs> I can make you send one right now. <laughs> so he's upset. He's broke now. He doesn't even have money. Ends up taking his daughter out to eat tteokbokki on the side of the street. And this is when we find out that Greg's got a really shitty past. So him and his wife divorced about three years ago and the wife has full custody of the daughter. She's already remarried to like this fancy businessman and uh, she's getting along with him. The daughter's getting along with the stepdad. Buys her a nice steak dinner for her birthdays. And he also finds out that she is moving to the United States in a year for the stepdad's work. So he's freaking out because if she moves, I mean, we all know what happens. She's so young. She's going to forget Korean. She's going to learn English. It's going to be harder for her to communicate with her own dad because they don't speak the same language anymore. And he's just really worried. He wishes that he had enough money so that he could get at least half custody of the kid so that she could stay in Korea for at least half the year. So defeated, he's like, I gotta go back home, you know? He gets to the train station, and I tell you, when you're having a bad day, everything sucks, right? So he misses the train by like 0 0.02 seconds, and he's pissed. So he sits down on that bench right next to him, and a very handsome man in a suit. I, don't, I didn't think he was handsome, I just... A very handsome man in a suit comes up, sits next to him, and says, Sir, I'd love a moment with you. Mm -hmm. No, 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 I don't believe in Jesus. No, no, sir, I, I would really love to, I was asking, do you want to play a game? What kind of pyramid scheme is this? He's like, I'm Buddhist, I told you, I don't believe in Jesus, I don't want anything to do with your shenanigans. And he opens up his briefcase and inside is a blue wadded, like square folded paper. Then we have a red square folded paper and wads of just straight cash. Mister, would you like to play a game with me? So I forget what the game is called, and I've never played this before, but apparently it's a very famous childhood game in Korea where you get two pieces of paper. Let's say I pick the red one. I put it on the ground. You grab your piece of folded square and you slam it down onto mine. 
I know that. You know that? I never played it. It's my grandpa generation. So it's a pretty old one. It's yeah. An old game. So you slam it down, and if you make they the fold opponents, the paper into yes. like a triangle or something, right? Yeah, the ones they were playing were square, but they were like intricately Fold folded. It. Yes, yeah. yes. So if you are able to flip the piece of paper, your opponent's paper that's on the ground over, then you win. Mm. Right? So he says, okay, I'll do it. Greg chooses the blue piece of folded paper. The suit man chooses the red and they start playing. Now here's the thing. Greg is as good at this game as he is uh, with his finances. He sucks, okay? He just immediately starts losing and losing and losing. And the dude's like, okay, well, remember the deals? You owe me money. For every round, what? it was $100 they had bet. So if Greg wins, he gets $100. But if Greg loses, he then owes him $100. So Greg is like, listen, listen, listen. He had lost like 10 rounds at this point. He's like, listen, listen, listen. I, uh, I don't have money. And the suit man's like, well, that's fine. You can just pay with your body. And slaps him across the face and tells him every slap is $100. He's just, he's just losing money, yeah. getting beat, yeah. losing more money, getting beat more. I'm telling you, when it's a bad day, it's a bad day. <laughs> and so this man, you just see this like time lapse of this really handsome suit man just beating the crap out of Greg. His cheeks are flaming hot red, both sides, mind you. Why do you keep saying he's super handsome? I didn't say that. This really handsome suit man. I think it was in the subtitles or something. Okay. I think that was actually in the casting. That's just his, his role. Okay. Fair. Handsome suit man. Okay, fair. Okay, fair. <laughs> I'm kidding. So he starts just slapping him side to side. And finally, Greg wins. And sure enough, suit man gives him $100. And he sits down and he says, you know, mister, there's other games that you can win money. A lot of money. He's like, ah, that's fine. I'm not that desperate, okay? I don't want to be in your little pyramid scheme. I just wanted to play some games while I'm waiting for the train. And he says, no, Greg, I think it's a good idea. He's like, how do you know my name? Greg, you went to Potato High School. You used to work at this motor company. You were let go 10 years ago. You tried to open up a chicken shop and then a little snack shop. Both failed. And now you're $250,000 in debt to the bank and $150,000 in debt to loan sharks. Oh, shoot. Handsome man works for the IRS. <laughs> yes. Okay, so he's like, what? How do you know that? How do you know me? What is going on? And he gives him a business card and says, call me if you're interested. The offer is on the table. We only have a few spots left and walks away. So on one side of the business card, we have the Squid Game logo. And then on the other side, we just have a phone number. We don't have a name, nothing. So he's walking home with this business card and he keeps thinking to himself, I mean, this is crazy. And he also noticed that there was a giant wad of cash in his pocket that he didn't win. So it seems like Suitman had just, you know, kind of blessed him for the night, I guess, just free cash. So he's in a pretty good mood. And on his way home, he runs into the mother of a man by the name of Sam. Now, Sam's gonna become important. Greg and Sam were actually childhood buddies. Like, they went to elementary school together, but as they got older, they kind of split up. Like, Sam got smart, so after high school, he goes to this super fancy college, then he started working at this, like, investment bank. I mean, he does business deals all over the world. I mean, just really crazy like that, right? And his mom is working at the night market selling fish. So he's like, oh, like, where's Sam? I miss him. And she's like, oh, well, you know how he is. I think he's in, a, in, in the U.S. right now doing some business. He's like, oh, cool, cool, cool. So he goes home, and that's when his mom starts badgering him. You got to do something. I heard your granddaughter is going to the United States. You got to make sure that you make some money so that you can at least get some custody over her. She's going to forget about you. And so that night in his bed, he calls the squid game. And they said, please state your name and birth date in order to enter. Greg, listen, I don't know his birthday, okay? I don't know his last name. <laughs> so he states his name and birth date, and they give him a location where he's gonna be picked up. And a van pulls up in the middle of the night. He gets in, and there's a bunch of people in the van, like strangers. It looks like they're potentially playing in the squid game too, but they're all knocked out. And he says hi to the driver, and he says, oh, I mean, I guess it was pretty late tonight, right? <laughs> and he's You're giggling. Sleeping? Yeah, and he's giggling, and that's when the gas starts permeating through the van, and he knocks out too. They were knocked out. And when he wakes up, he's in a blue tracksuit and a giant 
warehouse room. Now this warehouse room is very, very interesting. So they've got these industrial size bunk beds that are just stacked like 10 people tall. There's about over 500 people inside of here. They're all wearing blue track suits. They all are dressed the same. They're in the same uniform. None of them have their phones. None of them literally have anything. They've got nothing empty handed. They've all been knocked out in the van. Nobody knows where this place is even or who's running this or why there's that many people. And they just have giant numbers on the front of their jackets and on the back so they go by player like let's say 200 player 25 so he starts kind of walking around they all start networking and the first person that he talks to is player number one now Greg happens to be the very last player he's player number four five six so he starts talking to player number one and he is not the norm. Everybody else is around Greg's age. They look like middle-aged ajoshis. I mean, there's some younger people, but they all look like 40s, 50s. But player number one is like in his 80s. The dude is old. So he's like, why are you here? <laughs> like, what is going on? And he says, I've got a brain tumor and the dementia is getting bad. I don't really have anyone to talk to me or to take care of me. And he's like, you, you're so old, you should be at home having like your kids take care of you. Yeah, I already know what's gonna happen to the old man. It's always the old man. It's always the old they man. They always throw into old man and then they're gonna die in the middle and it's gonna make you cry. I already know. <laughs> oh, and then Greg is like, you should be having your kids take care of you. And the old man's like, oh yeah? Are you taking care of your parents? I didn't think so. So he's like, oh, okay, well that makes sense. And then we also see that midnight her name is Hebelk, which means like midnight or in the middle of the night. Uh, we're gonna call her Blair for this video. Blair, the pickpocketer that he ran into in the horse lobby, is also there. She's a player in the game. Small world. Now, she also happens to know another player by the name of Damien. He's a gangster, an absolute, like, true gangster. Not in a nice way. Like, genuinely is, like, beating up people on the streets, okay? For money, for cash, shaking them down. And she's already getting into a fight with this guy. It seems like they knew each other outside of the game, and they have some sort of turf war going on, but Damien is just terrorizing the crap out of Blair. And as they're about to get into a physical altercation, a buzzer sounds in this giant warehouse room filled with like 500 players and these masked red hoodies walk in. So they've got these big black masks on and they're wearing head to toe red. I want to call them the red coats, but I feel like that's historical or something, okay? The, like the red hoodies, the red coats. Red riding hood. Red riding, why, mm, red coats. <laughs> red riding hood. Red is so hard to say. Red riding hood. Red riding hood. <laughs> there we go. So they walk in, just uniform, march in with machine guns attached to them. It's giving me money heist. Money heist. Why didn't I think of that? It's giving me money heist, but not as cool of masks, okay? So they got these machine guns, they walk in and they make an announcement. We would like to extend a very heartfelt welcome to all of you. You will participate in six separate games over the next six days. If you win all six games, you will receive a big cash prize. And one of the dudes starts screaming, Why should we believe you? You kidnapped us. You drugged us out. I don't know where I am. You took my wallet. You took my phone. Why would I believe anything you say? So they start playing videos on the screen. They say, Player 218, Sam. You used to work at Joy Investments, but now you embezzled all your money, invested in future options, lost it all. You were about $550,000 in debt. Player 12, you got laid off from your job, you took out loans, and now you are $300,000 in debt, and the loan sharks are coming for you. And they start listing a bunch of these players that are speaking out against them, saying, listen, you are in financial ruins. I don't know, okay, what you think, but like, we're not trying to take your money. Like, you are all needing money badly. You all have debts that you can't pay off. You're on the brink of financial ruins. When you first met us, you didn't trust us, but then we played a game and we earned your trust. We gave you the money that we promised to give you and sometimes more. I will give you one last chance. You can either choose to go back to your normal lives being chased by loan sharks and being depressed or will you seize this last opportunity that we are offering you here? Should I just speed cut this one? You're doing great. Thanks. So you're telling me I spend my money on useless sunglasses, but I've never bought a good vegetable peeler in my life. That's what you're telling me right now? Where are my priorities? The next step of this is gonna be incredibly loud. You get a piece of straw. A metal straw would have been better, but I don't have any. Then you're gonna want to bang a straw through 
to create a tunnel <laughs> for ketchup. And they say girls can't build things, so I don't know. Okay. Whoa, you did it! Of course I did. Whoa! Okay, now I cut the potato. There's a piece of hair. Disgusting. So they give them the chance to think about it. You want to go home? Go home to your depressing life. If not, you will sign consent forms and you have to abide by the rules in order to play. So they ask, well, how much is this cash price? Like, at least let us know what we're playing for. And that is when the ceiling opens and they drop down a giant pig, okay? It's like this giant clear piggy bank. And they said that every game, there will be money funneled into this cash pig. They will tell you how much you're gonna win after the first game. So you technically have no idea going into the first game if it's even worth it to enter this competition. Do you win money after each game no. or only the final? Only win the off final. Oh, okay. Yeah. How much side? I mean, what kind of potato do you like? You know? Whoa, clean. That's clean. You should be an architect. You know, I thought about it. I'm wow, kidding. Wow, that's really good. Thank you. That's a chunky fry, honey. Honey? Ugh. Oh. Honey? Yeah. What is that? Honey, that's good. That's not a French fry. No, that's perfect. You know, I feel like you're being picky for no reason. Uh -oh. Too close to the edge. It's too close, honey. I you ruined you. it. You ruined it with I your. Didn't ruin you it. keep telling me. No, it's clear. I, it's gonna break. Yeah, you gotta make another one. See, I'm just gonna do chunky then. Leave me alone. Learn from your mistake, you know? Do you gotta get the potato out of the straw. Why? Just blow on it. This feels like a game in the squid game. Okay, it's not perfectly straight. <laughs> Why is there hair? Nice. That's it. I can't do it anymore. That's a chunky fry. Yeah, but I can't. Listen, I can't. Okay, then okay? let's take it out and see. <laughs> 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 this makes me so uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm gonna fry this up. Okay, then you take it's out the straw. The fattest fry ever. And then you stuff it with ketchup. No, I should make them more. I should do it one at a time. It's kind of not even at all. So they have everybody line up in a row and start signing these consent forms. Don't ruin it. I ruined it. Talk to any of you. What? What? <laughs> what the? You're that strong now? <laughs> wow. I pierced through the potato. It's a one hour long video so we can make two french fries. Oh, this one's a hard potato. Push, trying to use your hand. There we go. There we go. Strong. And this is a popsicle. <laughs> All right, hand it over. Okay. <laughs> this is embarrassing, okay? So if you sign the forms, you play the first game. Now, there were some people who didn't end up signing it. They lost a couple that way. And then once they've signed it, they start getting led up to this beautiful pink and green maze. Remember the hallways of Harry Potter where the stairs move? They're all over each other. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Well, this is that, but pink and green. Like, this is my dream in life. So they're led up these stairs. And it kind of implies wherever they may be, it's underground. It's a bunker level. Because once they get to the top doors at the very top, they are on ground level. They're in this very big open field, but what's interesting about it is it looks like the field goes on and on and on and on forever. But if you look closely, the walls are painted. So they're kind of trapped in this like bowl almost. Wait, explain? So they get let up the bunker and it's this open field, but the walls are painted to make it look like an open field. They're kind of in this bowl, in this tray almost. And you can actually see a clip of them closing the lid. Think of a Tupperware container and these mechanics close the lid so it's like and it's got- it's like a fake world. Yes, it's like a fake- Like Hunger Games. Yes, and it's on a freaking um, an, an island where no one's gonna see them once they close it because there's grass on top. It just blends in. No helicopter is coming to save them. So once they get to that top floor, it's just this open sandy field and this ginormous doll that you guys have probably seen all over TikTok. The ginormous doll is standing on the opposite side. She's got cameras for eyes. And they say the first game is going to be <laughs> which means red light, green light. You guys played that before? No. So essentially, I turn around. If I'm it, 
I turn around and I say green light. Oh yes, yes, yes. Then you can move. But if I turn around and I say red light and I see you move, because in, if you're in the middle of running, you have to pause. When I say red light, if you move, if you trip, if you fall, you get eliminated. The whole plan of the game is to get to the other side, to get to where I am without ever getting caught, without ever getting eliminated. So those are the rules of red light, green light. So they start. I mean, everyone's pretty stoked. This is a childhood game. They were expecting some sort of crazy, like you know, the Japanese one, the manga, I believe, liar game, where it's yes. like really complex. You got to put your mind into it. I mean, these are forty-year-olds who have grown up playing this. So the doll turns around and says, "무궁화 꽃이 피었습니다." And she turns around, and on the very first level, player three twenty-four moves, and the robot says. Player 324 eliminated, and a shotgun comes out and shoots him, and he drops to the ground in front of all the players. Ooh, somebody shot him and killed him. Well, that's what we don't know. I mean, there's no blood, so maybe he was tranquilized,、oh, right? So、okay. the other players are like, "What the fork?" And one of them, play, I believe, like let's say player 12, walks up to him while it's green light and starts kicking him. Hey. You can get up now. Like you're eliminated. You're not getting the money, but just go home. So he starts kicking him, and that is when player three twenty four starts spitting up blood. <gasps> so this guy freaks out, but the doll turns around, and he starts screaming, and he starts trying to run to the back, and she shoots him. And then everyone starts screaming because this time, when the second player was shot, all the blood splurted onto the players behind him, and they did not realize that being eliminated means you're gonna get shot by a real bullet. So they start screaming. They're running to the doors that are now locked, the ones that they came out of, and there's just shots fired. I mean, at this point, half of the group is dead. The other half is just paralyzed in fear. And they have to keep going because if they don't make it to the line, if they don't cross the line within five minutes, they're going to be eliminated. They're forced to keep playing the game, and they slowly go a little further and a little further. And at one point, Greg can't move. A player had grabbed his leg, and he had been shot. And he said, "Please don't leave me. I can't die here like this. Please don't leave me. Please don't let me die." And Greg had to literally shake it off, like Mariah Carey once said. So he shook off the dead player, and he made it with this other guy named Abdul. They call him Ali. He made it with Ali within seconds of the timer going off. They were the last ones to cross the line, and then they're escorted back into their warehouse room. And I mean, this is a field day. People are shook. So at this point, half the group is dead. They just witnessed people get massacred. What are you doing? What is this sick game? So once the red coats come back in, they're screaming, "Please, you have to let us go!" They start getting on their knees. So a lot of the people are under the impression that this is a loan shark thing. Maybe they had all borrowed from the same loan shark, and now this loan shark is. I told you how many times did I tell you that I'm going to kill you if you don't give me my money? Now they're getting killed. So they keep begging the red coats, "We will give you every single penny, please. I'm a mom. Like I have this. I have this family at home. I can get you the money. Don't worry, please." And they're like, "What are you talking about?" The red coats tell them there must be a misunderstanding because we're not loan sharks. You don't owe us money. We're not trying to hurt you. We're trying to give you a fair shot to win a lot of money, a cash prize at the end. You're just playing some games. You signed the consent form. You wanted to play these games. Meanwhile, of course there is. There is, of course.、Uh, there was this、um, during the whole first game. There was a viewing room with this leather sofa. A man, a very rich man, we don't know the face of, holding a whiskey glass. Jazz music, watching these people get murdered real time. You know, 'cause rich people are crazy. He even watches when the red hoodies they start putting all of the dead people from the first game into coffins, and there's a basement incinerator where they're just literally. I mean, there are some bodies that are still alive, like they haven't been shot in the head, and they're moving around in the coffins. They're screaming, but they stick them into the incinerator anyway. The red coats have no, no sympathy. They have no hearts right now. So they start freaking out even more. The the players are like, "Please let us go! Please let us go!" And the red coats just repeat, "You signed the consent form. Rule number one: All players must play in all the games. Rule number two: You cannot refuse to play once you have signed it." 
And that is when Sam, a childhood friend of Greg, remember that guy that went to that school that had a fancy job at that banking, you know, place, and his mom works at the fish market near where. Yes,、yeah, the mom says he's in Amer- America. Yeah, well, he's there, and Greg is shook. He's like, "What the heck? Why is my childhood friend, who's like literally doing the best out of all of us here, what's going on?" He stands up and he says, "Rule number three: If majority of the players refuse to play, then the games will end." Oh, what? Is that not true, Redcoats? And they get on their Bluetooth, and the big boss says, "Let them vote." So they all stand in a line, one by one. They go, they go up to a buzzer. Now there's 201 people left after the first game. Yeah, they killed like half of them. Okay. Now you press either like the yes or no. No meaning you guys all go home after this. Do everyone see what each other press? Yeah. So before they start voting, the giant pig had started filling up with money. Because the redcoats wanted them to know exactly how much was left after the first game. What do you think it is? How much is left? How much is in the bank now, on the line? Did they ever tell them how much it was there? Not yet. After the first game. I don't know. Ten million. Twenty million dollars. Wow. And after each game, they will put more money. The total prize at the very end is close to forty million dollars. So that's a lot of money. That's life-changing money. That's not even life-changing money. Like a million dollars, even a hundred thousand dollars, even ten thousand dollars is life-changing money. But forty million dollars, like you could go from average Joe、mm-hmm. to being a Kardashian.、Mm-hmm. So、okay. Greg presses no. It starts from the last person down to zero or down to one. Greg presses no. One by one, they all go up, press yes or no, and they're all thinking like. What am I gonna do when I get back to my old life, right? How am I gonna run from the loan sharks? So by the time that it's two hundred people are over, it's one hundred to one hundred. What? And the tiebreaker is Grandpa. <gasps> oh no! And Greg is like, "Fork! This guy had a brain tumor. Like he's. I mean, even if he didn't, he has like no years to live. Of course, he's gonna press yes. So he starts freaking out. Some of the other people start fighting because everyone's like, 'Are you guys crazy? Why would you press yes?' And they're like, 'Are you crazy? What's out there for us? Nothing's out there. I'd rather stay in here and try to fight for this than go out there where I know I'm gonna keep losing.'" And so they keep arguing about that. Like you gotta press no, but everyone keeps looking at that piggy filled with money. And Grandpa goes up there. He's a tiebreaker, and he presses no. <gasps> What? And everyone gets drugged up, placed back into their clothes, placed into vans, and thrown into the streets of Seoul. They wake up just like being tossed out of a van. They have no idea where they were. They have no idea who took them. Nothing. That's unexpected. Yeah. And so they're like, "What the heck do we do now?" Now immediately, Greg is one of the first to go to the police officers. He's like,、Mm-mm, "I'm not doing this." He's at the police and he's yelling at this uniformed officer, "You gotta do something! They kidnapped us. They drugged us. They put us in these uniforms. Oh my god, there was hundreds of us. I think they killed two hundred people." Oh yeah, doing what? You know the game, Muako、uh, Chipias Red Light Green Light. You know that? The children's game? Yeah, but but if you lose, they kill you. Uh huh. Okay. What did these people look like? The killers? I don't know. They had masks on. They were all wearing like red coats. Mm. Mm. Red coat. How did you escape? They they let me. They let you. They let. They killed two hundred people, but they let you escape. No, we took a vote. They let you vote. Wow. Okay. Wow. That's. You know what? You're right. That's crazy. And he's like, "Oh my God, you don't believe me." So Greg pulls out his Squid Card business card, and he's like, "Call the number. Call the number. Tell them you want to play the game." So the police officer dials the number. <clears throat> Hello. I would like to play the game. I'm I'm really good at games. I love any type of games. Oh, I'll do anything to play a good game. And the woman says, "What? Who who are you? Why are you calling me this late? Who is this? I want to play the game. What are you talking about?" What game, you pervert? Go to an internet cafe if you want to play a game. And she hangs up on him. And now the police is like, "Well, we can definitely check you into like a mental facility. How about that? What's your name, Greg? Okay, well, Greg, I know a good hospital around here." And he's like, "You know what? Forget this." And he leaves. And as he's about to leave, he makes eye contact with a detective. So detectives in Korea are plain clothes. It's kind of like in the U.S. So he's just wearing like normal day clothes, and his name is Detective June. So he runs into Detective June, who's like, "What's wrong with that guy?" And the officer's like, "Ah, you know hobos these days." That's what he says. Just like crazy, you know, guy on drugs probably. 
Now that Greg is out, he starts looking for his childhood friend, Sam, and they start talking. Turns out Sam had embezzled money from his company and now he's over $6 million in debt. He put everything on the line, his mom's house, his mom's shop, everything is down on the line as collateral. And so he's thinking, well, now he's just gotta come clean to his mom, which he doesn't know how to do it because she thinks that he's off in the United States eating fucking lobster and steak all day, living the best business life, putting it on the company card, writing it off. But he's not, he's in debt and he's about to lose it all. So that night he tries to call his mom, but she's just so happy that he called. And she keeps asking about America and what's he eating, eat healthy because Americans only eat greasy food. Yeah, I mean, she's not wrong. And so she's like, please, please, please don't bring me anything. You always try to buy me expensive things. Don't do that, I just miss you. So he doesn't tell her and he lays in the bathtub and he thinks about how to take his life. But there's a doorbell. And he goes to check, and under the door, someone had slipped in another Squid Game card. But this time, instead of a phone number, it said, same place, June 23rd, and it gave him a time. It's the same pickup place. Meanwhile, Greg gets a phone call from the hospital. It says, mom. He rushes there, turns out she has this nasty foot infection, and they might have to amputate it. They tell him straight up, like, she has not been treating this infection. It's only getting worse. It's going to spread unless we... Her foot, so we gotta do something. And meanwhile, the mom is like, no, we're good. She gets out of the hospital bed against doctor's orders and starts walking out. And he's like, mom, are you crazy? Are you kidding me? You gotta stay in the, it's gonna get worse. They're gonna take off your foot, maybe your whole leg. And she's like, well then if I'm in here, who's gonna pay rent, huh? You, you can't pay rent. And he's like, well, let's think about it later. And she's like, think about it later when? I'm gonna lay in the hospital bed. Do you know how expensive hospitals are? Mom, we have insurance. No, we don't. You canceled it. So I gotta keep working. And they both cry on the way home. Then we get to see some of the main characters' lives on the outside. We got Blair, the pickpocketer. I freaking love her, okay? Now, turns out she's a North Korean defector. There's a lot going on in this what? game. Okay, she's a North Korean defector. She's maybe in her early 20s, if even. Her little brother is now in an orphanage. At least he's across the border. He's in South Korea with her, but their dad was murdered on their escape, and their mom was sent to China. So her, their mom had escaped to China, but for some reason, the North Korean authorities got her in China. So her mom was dragged back to North Korea, which we can only imagine how bad that's gonna be for her. So her whole thing is she's trying to get money so that she can pay someone to smuggle her mom out. The last person that she had paid, she trusted, she gave them their, her whole life savings, scammed her ran off with all the money and her brother keeps asking her when are we gonna be a family together again everyone here i told them that you and i are gonna live together again and they just keep laughing at me they said that i'm never gonna get out of here i'm always gonna be here and she needs about half a million dollars which is plenty inside of that pig then we've got Abdul, another key player. So these are going to be like the main characters that you follow out throughout the series because, I mean, there's just too many people to keep up with. Abdul, he had immigrated from Pakistan with his whole family and he was in search of work. So he gets this job at this big manufacturer, starts working these big machines, doesn't get paid for six months, and then has a work accident and they refuse to pay the hospital bills. So he actually lost like three of his fingers. And now he's in debt. Now he has loan sharks chasing after him because like I said, for the six months that he was working, he wasn't getting paid. And on top of that, he has a one-year-old son. His wife is struggling. They have to send money back home to Pakistan. Like it's, it's just a really bad situation. This is the French fry. It looks good, huh? I'm excited. Okay, let me fill it. Hold on. I'm so nervous. Don't mess that up. Too much on the line. Oh yeah. Oh, I can see it going down. Really? It looks, I can see the red. That was not sanitary, I will tell you that. Wow. And then the bottom. Wow. wow. Look at that. Ketchup infused french fry. Yeah, yeah, Innovation. Yeah. I have high hopes for these. This one went all the way through. <gasps> Beautiful. Oh, I can see. Look at the bottom. Oh my god. Oh my god, that's so good. Yes. Wow, that is beautiful. Wow. wow, exciting. Okay, go stick them in, bruh. It is in the air fryer, okay? The potatoes are frying up via the air. What is happening right now, okay? Now at this point, Detective June, he starts getting a little frazzled because his mom calls him up and is like, hey, 
Your little brother is missing. I don't know what the deal is. You need to find him. He hasn't talked to me. He hasn't called me. Go find out. Go to his apartment. So he goes and being the cop that he is, he starts investigating. He starts going through his brother's things and he finds a card. The Squid uh -oh. Game card. And he remembers seeing that at the police station with this guy who was talking about how 200 people were killed. And he's so confused. He runs back to his fellow police officers and is like, hey, what's that guy's name again? The crazy one that came in here talking about some Squid Game. What? Why do you want to know? So they tell him he looks at where Greg lives, finds Greg, and is like, you got to do something. You got to help me. I think they took my brother. Have you seen my brother? And he's like, I can't help you, dude. So he just brushes it off. Meanwhile, everyone decides to go back to the game. So they go to their usual spots. They get loaded into a van and they get knocked out. Everyone except for Blair, the pickpocketer. She's smart. She holds her breath when the, all of the, the smoke is coming in and she is able to be awake. This is important later. Now everybody else is knocked out and the van drivers have no idea that Detective June is following them. He's tailing them. He's trying to find out where his little brother is. So then he sees that they're getting to this massive ferry. They're gonna get onto this, you know those giant boats? They're more like shipping boats where they ship just tons of cars. There's just rows of vans because that, like 187 people are going back to the game. Mm -hmm. So Detective June smuggles himself onto the van and they decide the Redcoats get out and they're doing roll call. So they have to scan everyone inside of their car. This implies that they've been chipped. <gasps> Oh my gosh. Starts scanning all of them. And as one of them is scanning, he starts getting strangled from behind. Detective June. Is strangling one of the, the red, red coat. Okay. Kills him, gets into the red jumpsuit with the mask, and throws the regular red coat off the ship. Sometimes life is a game, and sometimes it's not. You know what's not a game? emails. When you are writing an email, when you're responding to an email, whether it be your landlord, your boss, your coworker, your colleague, your fellow students, your teacher, your professor, you got to make sure that that email is on point. And I find that really hard to do because sometimes I ramble. Sometimes I have problems with tone and clarity, or I spend so much of my time Googling synonyms for the word great. And so my fiance told me, Hey, if you're feeling this way about answering emails, just download Grammarly because he's been using Grammarly for years because he has trouble with the English vocabulary. He is Chinese. The free version of Grammarly does like your basic spelling and grammatical checks, which are amazing. But the premium version is where I have the most fun because in real time, as I'm writing my email, it gives me clarity suggestions saying, Hey, Stephanie, wait a minute. This is a little bit confusing. I feel like the recipient is going to be lost on this one. Or sometimes it gives me vocabulary suggestions saying, Hey, you overuse this word a lot. Let's stop doing that. Let's replace it with this word. And it also helps with tone. If you guys want to keep it professional in your emails. It helps you stay consistent throughout the email. I'm obsessed because it saves me so much time. I use it practically everywhere. Like it works with my Gmail, my Google Docs, but it also works with like text messaging or Twitter. I use it on my phone, on my browser, but also with Microsoft Office. I mean, it's just so versatile and I feel like it's like this digital writing assistant and I get real time feedback. I don't have to send it to my sister and all my friends saying, Hey, does this sound okay? <laughs> so cut down on that editing time and write more efficiently and confidently you using Grammarly. Get 20% off of your Grammarly premium by signing up at grammarly.com slash bam. That's 20% off of your Grammarly premium that you're going to use every day, I assure you, at grammarly.com slash bam. That's g-r-a-m-m-a-r-l-y dot com slash b-a-n. Like I knew this was coming, but I thought that he would squeeze himself into the game as a player. But no, he's a red coat. He's working for the bad guys. And automatically, people are a little bit suspicious of him because he starts talking to them and they remind him of one of the very strict rules of do not speak unless you're spoken to. So there's rankings to this shit. Each one, they either have a circle, a white circle on their mask, or a square or a triangle. And only the big boss, they call him the front man, he's dressed in all black with an all black mask. So there's levels. Squares are the next highest, and then I believe it's triangles and circles, or circles and triangles, but it's regardless. So he's one of the lower ranks, and he's like, okay, will do. And he gets back into the car. Now all of the players, unconscious, are dragged into this changing room where the red coats are changing them out of their clothes into uniforms, putting all of their personal belongings into a box, except for Blair because she's awake. So she manages to pickpocket the knife back. So she had a knife 
and the red coat had taken it and put it in his pocket. Mm -hmm. But she pickpocketed back. Now she's armed with the knife. She might be the only one that's going into this next round armed. And all of them wake up again in the same warehouse, in the same spots. 187 of them had come back. Now at this point, they're networking again. They're eating breakfast. And Greg and Sam are like, you know what? We should start a little team. Now they enlist Abdul, Ali, right? Ali, they're like, come on, Ali, you'll be in our team. And they're looking at Grandpa. And they're like, of course, you too, Grandpa. We don't know what games we're going to be playing. So maybe we should have a little gang. So that night, there's no game. Everyone goes to their prospective beds. And they're supposed to be sleeping for the next day but Megan okay she's one of the crazy players she's a mom that's how she stands out okay she's Megan the mom but she's kind of an interesting person she starts screaming in the middle of the night to the red coats that she needs to go use the restroom and they keep ignoring her so what does she do she says okay then clean this shit up and she pulls down her pants and starts trying to urinate on just the floor of the warehouse room so they open the door and she says see this is what's wrong with Koreans you gotta yell at them to make them do stuff she's Korean by the way okay so she's like, let's go to the bathroom. Meanwhile, Blair is like, wait, I want to go too. So both of these women who don't get along are escorted into the bathroom. Megan immediately digs into her hoo-ha where she had hid uh, a little baggie. And so Megan pulls out a pack of cigarettes from her hoo-ha and starts smoking. That was her contraband. She smuggled in cigarettes of all things in her hoo-ha. All right, I don't know if that's sanitary. She should go see a gynecologist. Now, Blair, she tells... She tells Megan, hey, we need to form a team. You watch out for me. You buy me some time. I'm going to go up into those vents and I'm going to find out what's going on. So she manages to crawl up with the help of Blair into one of those ceiling vents. She's crawling around looking at people, looking at red coats in their little rooms. They all have their masks still on. And then she gets to the kitchen and the red coats are pouring this like massive white powder into some sort of liquid on the stove. And she's weirded out by this. So she comes back down and Megan keeps asking her, well, you told me, you told me it's a deal. You're going to tell me what you saw. So tell me. Um, in the kitchen, they're, they're making some sugar. Sugar? What could that be? I, I don't know. The next morning, everybody wakes up and they're all handed breakfast. Now there's another player by the name of Dr. Ted. He's a doctor. He's in there because he had killed a patient on the operating table, so he needs the money because he's got a lot of lawsuits. So Dr. Ted gets his piece of bread, but interestingly enough, when he bites into it, there's a tiny pink little piece of paper and he opens it up and it has the word honeycomb on it. And he's confused, but then he gets it and he freaks out. Now it looks like maybe he's in cahoots with some red coats and they're all in it to win the money together. He gets tips on the next game. That's what I felt in that moment. Meanwhile, the rest of the players, they're clueless. But Sam is really observant. Greg's childhood friend is really observant of people and he notices that Blair is acting a little bit weird. Like she knows something. And so he goes up to her and is like, hey, tell me what happened. Tell me what you know. And she fesses up and she says, I don't know what it is, but they're cooking up a lot of sugar. Now they're led into game number two. They're led through the maze into this giant playground room where there's like clouds painted on the skies. There's these giant like playground ellipticals and there's four shapes on the wall. Triangle, circle, star, and an umbrella. So the red coats say, hey everyone, listen, pick a shape and stand behind it. So Greg's like, well, Sam, what you think? You're the team leader, huh? You're the smart one. Did I tell you guys he went to the best college ever? Anyway, Sam, what do you think? Be the team leader. So they're all standing around and he says, well, it's me, Abdul, Greg, and the grandpa. It might be weird if we all pick the same shape, right? Yeah. So we get a flashback of Sam. When he was a child, there was a grandpa who was selling talgona. Do you guys know what talgona is? Really brittle candy. So they sell it in the shape of a circle, but there's always like a little shape imprint on it, like a design. And if there's a little, um, I don't think most vendors do this anymore, but back then apparently what would happen is kids buy this little talgona and if they're able to eat around the shape perfectly, they'll get another free talgona. What? So it's like the most brittle candy. It's not even uh. like bark. It's like just thin layers of candy. Like if you've made tanghulu, you know how fickle sugar is. Mm -hmm. So he's thinking, oh my God, I think we have to cut out the shapes. Cut out? Because that's what you do as a kid. You get talgona and inside of the circle, there's a shape. And if you're able to cut it out perfectly or eat it around it perfectly without breaking it, the Taigona street vendor will give you a free cookie. And those are four giant shapes? What are they made out of? 
sugar. Oh, brittle sugar. That's so easy to crack. Oh. So he decides, I'll pick triangle, guys. Okay. And Greg's like, I'm, I'm gonna do umbrella. And Sam looks shocked because umbrella. I mean, you're gonna die. That's like the hardest shape. Are, are you sure, Greg? And he's like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Umbrella's good luck. My mom always gave me umbrellas. And Greg notices that Sam was looking at him a little weird, but they all decide to pick their shapes. Grandpa goes with star, Abdul goes with circle, and they wait in line. And once the doors open, everyone's picked their shape. They're handed a tiny piece of targona, like the size of your hand. There's the shape, corresponding shape inside, and you've got to cut it out with a tiny sewing needle. If it breaks, if it cracks, if it bends, you are eliminated. You have five minutes. So they start just needling it. I mean, they're going crazy. People are di literally during the game. They don't wait till the end. You crack it on spot, you're eliminated. So people what are happens? getting anxious. There's they shoot you dead in the forehead. In the middle of the playground, in oh the middle of God. the game. So like, if you're working on it and you still got three minutes in, but you crack it, dead. And so everyone around you starts getting more anxious. There was an instance where a woman was so anxious watching other people die that she cracked her targona right on the spot and then dead. Dead. I mean, everyone's freaking out, specifically Greg, because he's got to cut out an umbrella, an umbrella shape. But he manages to use his brain and he starts licking the back of the targona to soften it up, to melt in the sugar a little bit so that it's easier to kind of crunch off without it being so brittle. And following his lead, the rest of the main team, which means Sam, Abdul, and Grandpa, they follow and they start licking the back. I mean, it's almost a comical scene. There's dead people around them and they're just licking a piece of sugar. And Greg manages to survive. And as he's being walked back to the warehouse room, he can't help but feel like, did Sam know something? Why did he look at me like that when I said umbrella? And when he gets back into the room, Sam says, you know, that was my fault. We should have just stayed together. Like there was no point. I didn't know. No, it's, you wouldn't have known. It's not your fault. It's fine. So Greg just plays it off. Should we give them the B-roll of the only french fry that survived without toddling, without popping? May I cut? No, cut it straight, straight, yeah. Whoa, it's a potato. It's a potato. Oh. Wow. Does it look cool? It looks a little weird. Like you're popping a pimple. Oof. Oh. Wow. Wow. Spectacular, truly. Truly revolutionary. Oops, oops I'm making Bits. a mess. Sorry. Bits. Wow. Wow. Shall we try it? Yes. Mm, it's undercooked. Oh, yeah. It's a raw <laughs> potato. So you're telling me an hour. Done. Over. One hour. Can I have your potato? Do you like it? Yeah, I do. This is the busted one. Okay, busted. You like raw potatoes? Mm. You like undercooked potatoes? Mm. I just love potatoes. <laughs> Can you eat that? So good. Yeah. Are you sure, honey? 79 players are eliminated from the second game and now the prize money has upped to 30 million dollars. So that day for lunch, everybody is standing in line while the red coats hand out one boiled egg and one soda pop. That's all you're getting for lunch. So what does Gangster Damien think about this? Remember Gangster Damien? He's like, no, I need two boiled eggs at the very least. I'm a growing boy. So him and Megan are hitting it off. They're flirting, they're doing stuff in line and they decide, why don't we go back around at the end of the line and get an extra boiled egg and get another soda pop. So that's exactly what they do, which means that the Redcoats had created just enough food for the exact number of people. Five people were out of food for the day. So oh, these so five they people, took other people's food. Yeah, are pissed and they keep saying, well, who the hell did that? And the rest of the players are pointing at Damien and his crew and Megan. And the Redcoats don't care. They literally couldn't care less. They're like, that doesn't matter to us. Like, we're not here about feeding you guys the same amount for lunch. Like, that's way above our pay grade. So this guy starts getting pissed. He's like, I need my lunch. And he goes up to Damien and Damien says, oh, yeah. And he smashes the glass soda pop onto this man's head and starts beating him to a pulp until He's dead on the ground. And Greg starts getting pissed off. How dare you? How dare you? And he's like, please, you have to get a doctor in here. You have to do something. And the Redcoats leave the room. And as they do, money falls into the pig. Each time someone dies, more money enters the pig. 
Oh, so it has nothing to do with the game. It's just more people dies. Wow, that's crazy. So now it's creating this really weird environment where some people are like, well, shoot, now there's more money in the pig, though. And now people are thinking in the back of their minds, if we just kill people, we'll get the money quicker. So as everyone's thinking about how they're going to kill people, Dr. Ted gets escorted out of the warehouse room with a couple of red coats, and he's led into the basement where they're incinerating those dead players, where they're incinerating the bodies. But they haven't burned them all. There's a couple lying in the coffins, and Dr. Ted immediately gets to work. So we find out they're running an underground organ harvesting ring with the red coats. So some of the red coats will delete the camera footage of Dr. Ted being allowed into the basement. They'll escort him out. They'll give him tips on the next game. And in return, he gives them organs out of these bodies. Because organ harvesting, you can't just like take them out. Like there's a whole procedure. If they're not taken out in a certain way, it's not viable. Then these red coats, they have all these diving tanks, this diving gear. They dive away from the island and they meet with Chinese people. Yeah, I know this, okay. Okay, and then the Chinese, they buy the organs from them. And so the Chinese these are, are running un behind? The front man. Ah. Yes. So there's another secret going yeah. on, okay. And so once he's done harvesting that set of organs, he said, well, tell me what's the game tomorrow. They hand him a boiled egg and inside is a note. And he says, okay, well, thanks. Let me know what the next game is then too. And they tell him, no, don't worry about that. Worry about staying alive tonight. We can't protect you in there. What do you mean? We wanted that fight to happen. We want to get rid of some of the weak ones. That's why we actually purposely brought in way less food than we should have. So tonight, it's going to be pandemonium. People are going to be killing people. Well, what the hell am I supposed to do? You guys need me for organ harvesting, so how are you going to let me go back in there? And they just tell him, stick with the strongest person, and you'll be safe. So he goes into that room, and Dr. Ted immediately goes up to Damien and is like, listen, <laughs> you and I, we got to be friends. Please don't kill me. And Damien tells him, listen, I'm not going to kill you. Tonight, just stay in your little corner, and if I hear you breathe... I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> what? Well, wait, you can't, you can't. Because I know what the next game is. And suddenly, Damien is interested. And suddenly, Dr. Ted is Damien's right-hand man, okay? They're just hanging out, best buds. The night rolls around. Greg, Sam, Abdul, and the grandpa, they're like, we gotta make a team, you know? We gotta be in this together. We gotta, we gotta make sure one keeps guard. Not all of us can sleep at the same time. We're a unit. Everyone's terrified. Now that night, the lights turn off and Damien takes out a little piece of glass that he had saved from his soda bottle, like a glass shard, and he's ready to go. And the redcoats are having a freaking blast. They start turning on the lights on and off. They're like, yeah, flicker the lights. I mean, it's pure chaos. People start knocking over like 10 layers of industrial bunk beds with people still in it. People are getting crushed by the bunk beds. People are falling from like 60 feet in the air. Like it's, it's going crazy. People are getting stabbed to death. Damien are just, just slitting people's throats and the what? next person he wants to get is Blair because remember they knew each other from the outside world so he goes straight up to Blair but she's got her knife so she starts kind of slashing him around he's trying to slash her and that is in that moment when in front of Blair a unit forms Sam Abdul Greg and grandpa and they say she's with us so you gotta get through us and what? Damien decides it's not worth it why I don't know they just likes her yeah Wow. So they back off, and now Blair is now officially a part of their team. Meanwhile, the chaos continues, and Grandpa goes up to a very top bunk, and he starts screaming at everyone. This is madness. I'm scared. Stop this chaos right now. Please stop. And the Redcoats come in, and they finally give the group some peace and quiet. They start taking out the bodies in coffins and they remove any contraband. So if you had a knife, if you had, you know, glass shards, they remove that. But guess who got off on all of this? Megan and Damien sneak off to the bathroom and they start doing it. They start having full on just all of it in that bathroom. They're sharing cigarettes. They tell each other their real names and Megan goes a little crazy on him. While they're doing it, she looks deeply into his eyes and says, listen, you and I, we're gonna stick together till the end of this. We're gonna get out of this together. Meanwhile, they had not known each other since before this. They just met like two days ago. And she said, you promise? Because if you leave me, I'm gonna kill you. 
He's like, I would never leave you. And they continue doing it. That night, 27 people died and now only 80 people are left. They get introduced into the third game. They're dragged into this completely stark white room. Everything's white. The ceiling's white. The stairs are white. No color in this room. I mean, I will say that compared to other games like this or to other movies or shows like this, like The Liar Game, The Hunger Games, it's got really fun aesthetics. Like everything looks very rich. Everything looks very colorful, very childish. It's not grungy, but it is gruesome. So I think it's like the juxtaposition of those two elements are really good. I mean, it works really, really well just for the visuals alone. I loved it. So they're in this stark white room and the rules are you have to find a group of 10 people within the next 10 minutes. Form into 10. Yeah, form into 10, into one group. So they've got five people in their group, Greg, yeah. Sam, Abdul, Grandpa, and now Blair. So they're like, okay, here's the mission. We each go find another recruit to bring into our group. But Sam's like, we got to do dudes. Because we don't know what the game is going to be. We just think that guys are gonna, probably going to be better at most things. Really sexist. So they all go out, they start looking for dudes. Not a lot of good dudes out there. That's when Blair brings in another girl. Her name is Jamie. She looks very like tough. So they bring in Jamie. Then they all bring in some like three other guys. Sam doesn't bring anyone because he couldn't find a dude that he liked. So now they've got nine people. What do we do? The time is ticking. And that is when they hear chaos. Megan begging on her knees, on her knees saying, I'll do anything. Like, why would you do that to me? Please, you said that we would be in this together forever. Why are you doing this to me? Like, you're just kidding, right? And Damien says, you're so pathetic. You're not in my team. She's like, babe, you're just joking, right? And he tells her, call me babe one more time and I'll kill you. And she flips a switch and she gets up, looks into his eyeballs and she says, you left me. So now you have to die. And he just laughs her off and walks off with his all-man team, all dudes. So Megan, she's teamless and immediately pounces on the main team. She's like, hi, well, uh, I know you guys were waiting for me. So she sits down and they're like, no, 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 this is the last thing we wanted because Sam wanted more guys. Now they got three women and an old grandpa. Only six of them are strong physically. So what is this next game? They're freaking out. So they're all led into this massive room. Like think of it as, like a Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter moment. I don't even know how this is possible, but once you're standing on the floor, you look over the edge and it's just like this massive drop. I would say maybe multiple stories to the ground. So there's like this platform that they're on. And then in front of them, there is an elevator that takes them to two big cranes that are facing each other, two yellow cranes. They're not connected, but they're facing each other. And each one has a platform that you can stand on. Mm -hmm. And the third game is tug of war. You know tug of war where you hold yeah. onto a rope what is and that you crane try to, doing there each team goes onto a crane suspended like hundreds of feet in the air oh. and the way to win is to pull the other team off the crane so that they're flying around in the air because everyone is chained to the rope and then once they're all off the crane a guillotine comes down snaps the rope in half and the losing team falls hundreds of feet to their death Oh my goodness. That's how you get eliminated, 10 people at a time. So to be fair, they go into a little box, they pull out a ball. The number one ball is team one against team five or team six. So it's the all male Damien team against a weaker team. So they go up onto the platforms, they start tug of warring, but like, you know how it's gonna be. They immediately lose. So 10 people instantly die and you see all the gruesomeness, like brains are smashed at the bottom and stuff. It's really intense. What? And then all of these red coats, they come in golf carts with these, uh, these coffins and start putting them in the coffins. But now the ones that do the organ harvesting, they put little markings on some of the coffins for the ones that look young and healthy. So the next teams to go up are team number four and team number five. Team number four is the main team with Greg. Team number five is an all-male team. I mean, it's not Damien, but it's an all-male team. So immediately, as they're walking to the elevator to lead them to the top of the platform, I mean, they're just saying, all right, well, I guess it's goodbye now. Like, we're all gonna die. Let's face it, it's what's gonna happen. And Grandpa says, wait, tug of war is not about strength. It's about strategy. They're like, shut up. How much strategy can you have with three women and you, Grandpa, you're like 80 years old. And Greg's like, no, 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 let's listen to him. Grandpa, tell us your strategy. Okay, well, this is how you play. So we've got to make sure that the lineup is good. At the very front, you want a leader, a leader that's strong, because the minute that the leader starts giving up, 
you're pretty much done because everyone behind you can see. Even the person in front gave up. Then at the very back, you need to have an anchor. It'll be Abdul. You need someone strong. You need someone reliable. They're the anchor of the ship. Then in the middle, everyone is alternating. I stand on the left. You stand on the right. I stand on the left. Left, right, left, right. And all of our feet are facing forward. Now the very important part is the first 10 seconds. First 10 seconds, you want to hold your ground. You want to stand your ground, not necessarily pull them. Put the rope under your armpit and lean back. Your stomach should be facing the ceiling. You should be able to look back and see the person behind you almost. That's how you need to stand your ground. So within those first 10 seconds, the other team, they're gonna get frustrated. Why won't they even budge? We thought we were stronger. They start losing their rhythm. That's when I say go. We start pulling the rope, but we also shake it up and down so they lose their rhythm. And we pull, 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 pull. That's how you win. How does grandpa know so much? <laughs> so they get up on there and they start doing exactly what he said. But it's not working as planned. As they're pulling, at first it works, but the all-male team, they gain their strength back and now they're pulling the main team off the crane. And so Sam yells, Trust me, we're gonna move three steps forward when I say go. And Megan is like, you crazy son of a bitch. I'm not going towards the edge of the crane. Are you crazy? And Greg says, come on, let's just try it. We have nothing to lose. Go. And they move three steps forward, causing the opposing team to fall because oh. they were putting so much pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they immediately start pulling and they manage to pull the entire team of guys off the crane and now they're watching as they're swinging and a guillotine comes down and the team of 10 fall to their death. After this, only 40 people are left. And that is it for this part of the Squid Game. Okay, this had to be two parts. It's nine hours long, the whole series, and each episode is, I think, over an hour? A little over an hour, like about an hour. So that's nine hours, and I wanted to give you all the juicy details. There's a lot that I also didn't put in here, so if you guys are interested in some gruesome, some dark, twisted things, go watch the Squid Game, and make sure to check out Extra and Grammarly, linked in the description. And I'll see you guys tomorrow for part two.